Good to be live walking in. <laughs> Hello, and uh, welcome to the stream. Um, my name is Peter Hedlock Smith. I am the uh, head of production, um, somewhat, here at Columbia UK. Uh, we're a charitable organization who um, focus on the subjects of diversity and inclusion, uh, particularly through creative um, means, podcast being one of them. Um, and today, um, myself and my guest, Michael Shadowby here, will be talking about uh, diversity and inclusion in gaming, basically. So um, we're going to obviously cover a few subjects uh, in, in the area uh, of gaming, um, specifically um, who are gamers, diversity uh, among gamers, obviously, um, diversity and inclusion uh, in and representation in video games themselves, so uh, diverse characters, that kind of thing. And we're going to touch on um, diversity and inclusion in the gaming industry itself, mm. so gaming uh, companies, but also the adjunct things such as gaming journalism, that kind of thing. Um, so as I said, I'm Peter Elzor Smith. My uh, guest here is Michael Shallaby. Michael, if you'd like to uh, say your, your hello. Mm. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for introducing me, Peter. It's very lovely to be here with you and everyone else right now. <laughs> so thank you. Perfect. Yeah, um, we are both gamers, um, as as was probably um, obvious given yeah, that we well, are discussing this subject. Um, well, so, uh, playing... Michael, tell, tell us a bit about um, your history of gaming. Well, I've been playing video games for as long as I can remember since I was very young. Back in the day of you know the old PS One, and used to even play quite quite a few PC games. Favorite PlayStation One games at the time was Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, <laughs> Crash, Crash Bandicoot classic. And even like some. That's known ones like Cooler World, where you literally play as a beach ball trying to solve puzzles. <laughs> as you do. As you do. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let's, we'll, I think we'll get started with our first major uh, topic, which is who are gamers, basically. Uh, obviously, us, as we've said. Yeah. But um, it's often not who you would think, basically, because there's the traditional or classical image uh, of the sort of teen, spotty teenager um, in, uh, in their mum's basement and then yeah. growing into, the, say, 30 to 40 year olds uh, shouting uh, abuse on online and basically being Eric Cartman. I, I mean, blame uh, South Park in part for that. <laughs> I mean, I personally had my own biases in video games by, by assuming everyone I encounter on an online game or any sort of video game will most likely be male mm. or no, more like myself. Yeah. However, uh, surprising, surprisingly, as of 2020 to 2021, about 63% of all female adults have played video games at mm -hmm. least once in the past year, which is a proportion way higher than I anticipated. Yeah, it uh, means that a good portion of uh, gamers are women. Basically. I mean, of course, the statistic doesn't take into account all platforms, but no. then again, another bias is what do you consider a video gaming platform? I mean, mm -hmm. another bias I personally have myself is I don't necessarily consider a mobile game very much when it comes to video games. Yeah. However, when it, when you look at gaming, it's the mobile game it's the mobile gaming market that has the highest penetration of um video games of the um, video game share. Yeah, so, even if they are massive money pits in many cases. In many cases, mm -hmm. but then again, you do have um many good video well good video games and good video game ports on yeah. on mobile. But then when you have a when you have such great access to a market, you're of course going to get a lot more money pits. Yeah. Based. But of course, other um, say gaming groups that uh, many people wouldn't necessarily um, expect is that a large portion of the uh, say gaming community and gamers are LGBT, uh, such as myself. I am uh, non-binary. Um, yeah, I use he and they pronouns I, interchangeably. I can never say hmm. which one I prefer. Sometimes I feel more he, sometimes I feel more they. I think today I'm feeling more they, so let's go with that. Oh, there you go. <laughs> exactly. But um, for me and many other uh, queer gamers, um, Video gaming has been a kind of a way for us to sort of explore our, our identities uh, yeah. and come to realizations. I mean, because I did not know I was non-binary till last year, basically. But part, part of uh, that would be a lockdown, um, allowing me time to kind of consider uh, what is going on in my head, that kind of thing. But also a number of um, prominent streamers um, coming out and being open about uh, their gender identity and uh, sexuality, that kind of thing basically, and uh, it, it, we found, I found, uh, certainly among, um, say, particularly streaming um, uh, groups, that um, a lot of queer gamers basically found each other through, um, they, uh, basically, gaming, mm. which is, a, which is uh, definitely a, a, a really good thing, basically. Um, I, I, think, I certainly think so. Uh, what about you, Michael? What, what do you think about um, gaming and LGBT um, groups? I mean... For me personally, I'm, I identify as asexual. I mean, 
well, for the longest period of my life, I just saw of myself as someone who was a disturbingly low sex drive. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of hard to kind of, for me, per, for me personally, I can't really compare my struggle to other pe- members of LGBT. I was never like, you know, persecuted or anything mm-hmm. for it. I just kind of, you know, kept quiet about it and just gone with my life. as all right, someone who's a disturbingly low sex drive. Mm-hmm. Didn't realise, you know, how normal that was until until playing various video games. I mean, the first video game which kind of made me... Well, it wasn't necessarily video games, per se, that made me realise it was normal. First thing that kind of showed me that this does exist was through watching Bojack Horseman. Mm. However, however, what I found which really helped me, I explore my identity a lot more, was through playing um, was through playing one of Obsidian's latest works, um, <clears throat> The Outer World. Mm-hmm. Have, well, A, being able to play as an asexual character yourself to yeah. then be able to relate to another character in-game who herself was asexual was a very meaningful experience for me. Yeah. And spoke to me on a more very, very personal level. Mm-hmm. This is one of the great things about um, the Outer Worlds and games made, um, like uh, role-playing games or RPGs as, well, as uh, we uh, generally refer to them, is that you often have the ability to choose your dialogue, um, yeah. which will allow you to... Um, forge your character and, and their personality but also in the case of the outer worlds you had the option when talking to pavati the character the ace the ace character to basically say i also don't have those feelings that kind of thing um you, you say, i mean you also had the option to be unpleasant and uh, say ridicule her <laughs> which is your choice it's, it's, a, it's a video game you can do that but obviously i chose not to <laughs> say that say those know. horrible things well of course in in my case i chose to um sympathize and relate was part of because exactly. i felt no the game was speaking towards my own experiences mm. with dealing with this kind of scenario and um, still trying to find some sort of romantic relationship when you're not the most intimately, you're not the most intimate person. Mm-hmm. Which is, it's a, I mean, Outer Worlds is a good example of that. The only issue is that you, there are no romance options for your character. No. <laughs> but many other uh, games do certainly um, have that. And um, yeah, I think, because um, we've talked about, obviously, uh, these uh, groups, um, of some of the positives, I think we do need to address some of the negatives, unfortunately. So. Um, while gaming has been a uh, place for many people um, to find each other, it's, it's been a place for LGBT people to find each other, but it has also been a place for more to- toxic uh, fandoms and groups to find each other, unfortunately. So while the image of the um, kid in the basement shouting um, obscenities and uh, racial slurs may not be necessarily the most representative, it's not all entirely inaccurate, unfortunately. There are. It's a very small but very vocal minority, and that, and that is well, the case. Well, it's always a vocal minority who, mm. tends, to, who tends to make their voices the most loudly heard. And I think back in, you know, back in Gamergate, starting mm. in 2014, um, you know, with the, whole, with the whole stereotype of the average gamer being white teenage boys, I think many of the people who got, who became very um, frustrated and angry during Gamergate saw themselves as the primary demographic of video games and yeah. saw and saw the inclusion of other um, ethnicities, other genders, for instance, as you know, eroding and eroding away their um, representation. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think many people misunderstood what misunderstood the intention behind um, many publishers and developers. Not yeah. saying that publishers and developers are good. Many of them are just out there for your capital and out there yeah. trying to mm-hmm. get as much of your money as possible. We've seen that with mobile game development, for instance. Mm-hmm. However, <clears throat> as regards to game game, many people saw them. Many people in one particular demographic saw themselves as the primary demographic without yeah. realizing that there, hey, hey, there are um, other groups of people who enjoy video games just as much as you do, mm-hmm. and therefore felt themselves being personally attacked when their group, when their demographic wasn't represented as much as previously. And I'm not saying that they were nev- not represented. It's just mm-hmm. you no, know, we're now having more inclusion of LGBT individuals, more inclusion of ethnic minorities, and yeah more inclusion of females, which I... Indeed, and I think, I think that's a good segue to talk about representation in games themselves, actual characters. We talked a little bit about the uh, say Outer Worlds, obviously, which is a good example, but um, I found, um, as somebody consuming media across the uh, board, often video games was the first place I would see representation way before films or TV. Some of the oh, yeah. first gay, uh, openly gay, openly bisexual characters, um, I've, I've seen were in video games uh, and indeed some of the first trans characters um, were in video games and of course thanks to RPGs you could play as um, say, as these kinds of characters basically. Oh, yeah. I mean I remember my first my first experience I mean, you know, encountering an LGBT ca- character was in Full Annie Vegas mm-hmm. and Excellent. what surprised me what surprised me about the character was that well 
They were very normal. They, mm. they gave me nothing about the fact that they were um, they were LGBT. They were just a normal human being who happened to be gay. And that's why I really yeah. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it does irk me sometimes when video games try and make, try and, you know, highlight the fact as much as possible that, hey, this character is gay. Yes, there, there is always the possibility for tokenism, which is uh, part of the, uh, the issue. I mean, it kind of reminds me of you know, J.K. Rowling when she, um, when she, she came out all of a sudden and said, "Hey, I'm Dumbledore is gay." All of a sudden, like, why? Just, just why? I mean, sure, representation, but there are. I mean, if he was, if she really intended that, she should have said it in the books. Yeah. Basically. Otherwise, it's just you could say that about any character if you, if you were to choose to do so. And I mean, you got fan. Um, fan fiction kind of thing that always ship characters and yeah. uh, they together as gay that kind of thing but you know that's what fan so that's what fanfic's for basically and in fact some of the best um uh writers in um nerddom come from fanfic some of the, <laughs> some of the uh writers on like so current writers on star trek star wars that kind of thing they were they wrote fanfic first basically so fanfic yeah. is very much a um entirely um valid um thing but yeah i mean all Out New Vegas, I think, is a very good example because uh, you've got at least two major characters who are uh, gay, basically, a, a gay woman and a gay man, uh, where it's just a kind of, uh, oh, hey, yeah, I, so my, I broke up with my ex-girlfriend, blah, 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 that kind of thing, just, just as, as a sort of, hey, that's a thing, but whatever. Yeah. And you could play your own character as bi or even gay because there were a couple of um, perks you could take that um, basically um, give your character special uh, traits or abilities. And uh, some of them specifically were about uh, your, give your character additional dialogue with uh, certain uh, characters. Um, they also give you more damage against the, yeah. uh, the, the particular type. It's a video game, so yeah, you're going to be shooting a lot of people. Yeah, but um, so obviously the, the standard one was, um, say, uh, was it Lady Killer and um, Black Widow for heterosexual. But then they created in New Vegas, um, Confirmed bachelor, old um, the Victorian term for gay man, basically, yeah. and cherche la femme, uh, which just means search for the woman, uh, standard uh, French phrase for uh, women, uh, for the female, so for female characters, uh, so basically, which allowed you to flirt with uh, certain uh, characters, um, and actually have there's quite a touching moment in uh, one of the, the downloadable content um, uh, called De De Dead Money, where you meet a character who is gay and. Um, you can actually bond with her um, with that, basically, with the kind of whole, no, no, I, I understand uh, yeah. what, what you're talking about, as in I have faced discrimination myself, that kind of thing. And it then makes it easier later on. You have a quite a touching moment where, although you can't actually see it happen, it's, it's, it's done in text dialogue where you can hold her hand to basically reassure her you're going to be fine. Yeah. Which I think is a really nice uh, bit of representation where it's just, it's just a thing. Just yeah, not... Just as not a big thing at all, just, yeah, hey, by the way, the uh, trope. <laughs> what I did really appreciate in Fallout New Vegas, just touching this one point very quickly, is that while you had those two perks, one, one which can make you a homosexual man or woman, you, you weren't limited to either of those perks. You mm -hmm. could... You uh, didn't have to use them. You didn't have to use them, or you could have both. You could yeah. be bisexual if you wanted. Yeah, exactly. You weren't limited to either one or the other. You could have both if you wanted, which I really appreciated as well. I think a good question um, we can uh, definitely go with is, uh, I mean, what else do you think the industry can do to help break stereotypes? Because, I mean, some of them have done a lot, but I think more can be done. So, so one of the biggest issues was, was in the gaming industry I've seen is the lack of representation to, of um, LGBT individuals or um, people mm. of color was, was in the streaming industry or the video game yes. one mm. or, on, or on YouTube. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of YouTube, of, um, YouTube game personalities or even um, Twitch Streaming personalities are um, unfortunately well, fortunately are unfortunate, but they are white white males, yeah. young white. For some, males. for some of them, that's I mean, that's not necessarily a problem. No. Um, that's absolutely fine. But some are less than pleasant about it, certainly. But then, as a result, you'll tend to have opinions that skew towards the people primarily of that demographic. Yeah, not necessarily. That's a bad thing. I mean, to be honest, some of my favorite YouTubers, such as Jim Sterling, for, Jim Stephanie Sterling. Mm -hmm. Um, well, now they're non-binary, but for... they are everything. They yeah. are non-binary, trans, polyamorous, pansexual, just everything. <laughs> um, they're great. But uh, people like, I mean, Angry Joe, 
he's, he's, he's a straight white male. Yeah. And that's absolutely fine. You know, that's, uh, that's not necessarily a problem. And he does what he can to um, help with representation, that, uh, that kind of thing, basically. Um, he has people on his show of uh, various different um, um, identities, that kind of thing. Um, but he, I mean, I, in, in the end of it, he's still a straight white man, yeah. basically. Straight white says man. But, I mean, one of the good things is that more streamers are starting to, because a lot of them people previously thought were uh, straight white says this male, but a lot of them actually admitted, actually, no, I'm not. Like, yeah. uh, Johnny Chiodini of, uh, say, originally Eurogamer now is uh, uh, their own uh, channel. Um, they came out as uh, non-binary um, a little while back. In fact, their coming out was one of the things that helped me to um, re realize uh, my identity. So um, certainly that's been a very good as uh, aspect, I would agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, you going to say something? <clears throat> oh, no, I was just going to touch upon that. So, but then again, but then again, you issue i find is that um when you have but like, well sorry i'm just mumbling my words but then so, so the issue i've so i've seen well well it's, well it's good you know having having your own rep demographic represent represented mm -hmm. the main issue i find is that when you only have one demographic which is primarily represented within the gaming industry you tend to have the um repens well the encouragement of more toxic behavior i mean for instance was the famous um Bridgegate incident with PewDiePie. Um, mm. I'm not going to say he's he holds up racist views or anything, but how, however, by him by him streaming that and by him choosing, you know, making that choice of words in that mm -hmm. in his situation does have an influence and it does kind of um, send a message that this kind of behavior is somewhat okay and is yeah. somewhat acceptable as in online gaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um... Just wanted to uh, say that uh, that question came from uh, um, uh, from a member of the audience, Anna Barker. Thank you for that question. Definitely. So uh, I think we could uh, carry on a little bit more about uh, stuff about the industry, because um, I think a good thing to talk about would be um, some of the um, problems in the industry itself. Because um, there are some say there are some good examples of uh, companies who do really well, like yeah. Bioware. For instance, um, creators of Mass Effect and uh, say Dragon Age, and they have a very diverse team. In fact, some of the original the... creative directors is gay, they, and uh, some of the main writers are of various different um, uh, identities. And as such, it, that is reflected in the games. They yeah. have, so they have really good uh, representation in games. But then there are more problematic uh, companies like uh, Blizzard Activision and Ubisoft. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. I mean, I'm, I guess you can see. I guess you can see some of the problematic aspects of the way they treat women and other minorities um, showcasing in games. I mean, once while I do love the Assassin's Creed series, or well, I loved them up until, um, let's say, Assassin's Creed Origins, mm -hmm. uh, one thing I, I did find very disappointing with Assassin's Creed Origins was their depiction of Cleopatra. Mm. Well, I'm not a historian. I just love learning about his ancient history. I mean, one of my uncles is an Egyptologist, so mm -hmm. I tend to... Um, get quite a lot of my knowledge from here, man. I do like to watch, read, you know, read various journals, just nitpicks, fascinating aspects of history. However, I just want to touch on um, Assassin's Creed's origins, depiction of Cleopatra, where she, mm -hmm. um, if I recall correctly, I'm just paraphrasing at this point. She said, I will, I will let fuck every man, any man, or any man who I encounter, as long as I can be the one who rule. Mm -hmm. Whereas Cleopatra historically, well, mm -hmm. she is the first of the Tom well, I'm here, um, dynasty who could speak Egyptian. Yeah. Everyone else in their dynasty before that could always speak Greek. Because mm, they were um, um, Hellenic. Or yeah, they were or Hellenic. They were descendants from no, yeah. Alexander the Great, some dynasty. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we, we've got a uh, question from uh, Paul Whiteley about um, this, say, a lot of this, uh, this stuff. Uh, basically. How do you think we can move past uh, tokenism in games and make it a uh, detail rather than a, a, de a uh, defining identifier? Well, again, I think the best way to do it is just have a character who happens to be, you know, LGBT yeah. or an ethnic minority, but make nothing of it. Not try and highlight the fact that... Don't be, make it a whole thing. I mean, and, yeah, I think a good thing, again, say, going back to Bioware, one of the good, we'll say one of the ways they do this because they have a diverse team. They yeah. have people of these identities writing about it, I mean, which means that some of their yeah. uh, romances, because, say, romance storylines, because they're written by uh, so many queer characters, the queer storylines are better than the straight ones. Oh, yeah, exactly. And another example of which was... In Obsidian's um, The Outer Worlds, the act voice actors of um, Parvati helped write the romance between Parvati and, mm -hmm. you know, the um, leader of the... Oh, what's the name of the station again? Oh, um, no, I forgot what it's called. Uh, Groundbreaker. Groundbreaker, Groundbreaker, yeah. 
Although, oh, I was going to touch on something else. <laughs> no worries. Well, I'm, I'm sure you'll think say think of it um, uh, say when we uh, cycle, say a cycle back. So, excuse me. So, I think in many cases, uh, a lot of um, companies are doing the right thing. It's a case that they need to say they should carry on doing what they're doing, but others should learn from them. I'm, oh, yeah. Uh, what, one thing I do want to say is an example of what not to do is mm. you could see in uh, an episode of Always Sunny where um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where they where they try to um. They try to get the highest rating for their own bar, but then they so they go see another bar how they do it, and they notice two guys who happen to be very good friends with each other, but one of the guys happened to be black, and they mm-hmm. thought, wait, wait, was was his friend black? I mean, if I had a, had a black friend, I'd make everyone know that yeah. I had a black friend. It seems like but, they should be talking about it. Yeah, like, that, yeah, no, not, just make don't do that. Yeah, go don't make don't a thing about that. it. Just let it be a thing. Yeah, I mean, because. There have been some uh, developments. I think I think we should talk about um, again. Say more. Say back uh, about representation in game. One of the best and worst examples of trans representation in video gaming, which is Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. <laughs> oh boy, where do we start with that one? Because mm-hmm. um, basically, in terms of positive representation, they have a storyline with the trans character. Who, I mean, she mentions it, she says it. Um, yeah. it, it's, it, it's, it does, it's just not a case of she walks up and says, Hi, I'm a trans woman. <laughs> that would be terrible. It's basically you meet her, you start doing a, a quest line with her, um, involving racing, that kind of thing. Uh, so, um, Eagle Eye viewers will, not- will notice on her uh, car she has a trans uh, flag um, on there. So I, I, I noticed that first. I was wondering, Oh, I- is she? And then, yeah, later on she said, Yeah, I am. Uh, but the whole thing about that story is that. Um, Light, light spoilers here, uh, but it, it is a side quest. Uh, basically, she ends up talking about her um, husband, who had sadly died, basically, um, and how for him it was never a problem. He loved her for who she was and saw her as the woman that uh, she was, basically. And the tragedy, of, often you get in um, films, TV, sometimes games, there's the, the classic trope of the, tr- of the tragic gay character where they're um, sad because they're gay, essentially. Um, and they're, they're, they're destined for ruin. Um, even though it's, it's not literally portrayed as that, that's kind of the inference. And this yeah. went around, so they completely bypassed that entirely. And it's, so the reason for the sadness is because she lost a man she genuinely loved. And I think that's a really good uh, example of representation. Let's talk about the problematic part, and that's um, in the character creator. Uh, Basically, you so you have the option to play as a um, male body uh, person or a female body person, but you can basically pick a body type, masculine shape, feminine shape, and you can then select the genitalia, basically, yeah. and you can even edit that, which is hmm, kind of unnecessary. Um, I mean, but the further problem happens is that your character's pronouns are connected to the voice you choose. So, I mean, tell, so tell me about your character <clears> that you, <throat> you created. I mean, to, when I was trying to create, well, so, sorry, when I was playing um, you know, Cyberpunk 2077, I tried to create a more bisexual character, you know, because I want to roleplay. I want to roleplay as different yeah. types of characters. I've done that in New Vegas. I've roleplayed, I've made many t- different types of characters just to kind of immerse myself in what their world would be. Mm. So I tried to make a more bit a more bisexual character in um cyberpunk 2077 so you no know, a masculine character was a more feminine voice mm-hmm. i've seen this in other video games where they've done it excellently for instance in near near automata you have the um npc pascal who has a very feminine voice but identifies and is recognized as a male mm-hmm. and i thought you know that's very well done and to be honest i i and nobody else thought anything of it mm-hmm. and so that was a kind of guess i was trying to go for with cyberpunk 2077 however when i chose a female voice Instantly, I was assigned female, which kind of threw me out of the immersion and thingy. So, and that is that is problem. That's so, so problematic. It's kind of a case that also they didn't even have uh, gen- say gender neutral um, uh, pronouns. They didn't have they them. You, no. It seems like the better thing to do would be to give you the option to choose your pronouns basically at, at the beginning, or you know just make a character who's canonically this the same one or the other that kind of thing. But my worry is that this can be kind of damaging to those who are undergoing their transitioning mm. because many people who are transitioning, who are female, for instance, who are rec- who identify as female or who are male and identify as male, may, may not have the you know the um voice the um voice depth that rep- that 
you yeah. know, may traditionally rep- represent their gender. Yeah, it's true. Um, and with their transition doesn't always and, and often doesn't affect um, their person's voice at all. No. And even then, I've met some someone who are biologically born, born as women who have, who have fairly masculine voices and some men who are biologically born as, as men who tend to have somewhat feminine voice. Exactly. So a voice really does, is not an, a, a, no. a, a determiner at all. Voice should not be what determines your gender at all. Mm-hmm. And I found that quite... Um, I found, I found that very disheartening personally. Yeah. It was kind of a, it was one step forward, two step backwards. Yeah, nice try, guys, but oh, you messed it, you messed it up, you messed it up. But certainly, um, I've been interested that non-binary and trans, are obviously, um, representation is obviously much more recent. Um, yeah, and it's 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 starting to increase, but it would be nice to see more uh, of it, definitely. And it, it's because it's a case that I, when I think back to it, I think of how many characters are the, as a, a video game characters identify as they, them, and there are a few, which is it, it's nice. Where it's just kind of like it's just a thing. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, some of them. The case of either developers have said this character gender doesn't matter, so use they them with it. Like uh, the the main character from Undertow is uh, is a identifies as they them. Never mentioned in game. Maybe it could be mentioned in game. That could be a uh, thing to uh, develop, develop a bit more. Like uh, in Bo- in Borderlands Three, you got the character Flack, yeah, who's, uh, a robot. So, but in <laughs> in the world, world of the game, um, robots often identify with more masculine or feminine. But they identify as non-binary. They actually have yeah. a, a non-binary pin, uh, like the one <laughs> I'm wearing, on their um, the uh, costume. Kind of the whole thing about the, their introduction is uh, they have a recording where they're basically saying. Um, I say archivist. I identify as, as, uh, as a neither a man or a woman, and say I. And so I prefer to use uh, pronouns as they them. Also, I have achieved a consciousness and thirst for murder. <laughs> the kind of uh, humor used in both. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, that's 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 certainly uh, definitely a big thing. But part of the reason um, I think for this previous hesitation about representation is that I think a lot of gaming companies have made those same assumptions about their players as many people outside of the uh, industry i mean I, agree? yeah no i agree i mean I'll, I'll be lying if i said i'd never made those assumptions i've made those assumptions myself as mm-hmm. stated at the beginning of the podcast i've made my own generalizations of what demographics um what what the main demographics of video games are and yeah and i think we can see just permeate towards the towards higher levels with video games developers and companies especially i'm going to go back to ubisoft for instance with their depiction of cleopatra and again, it's to you know, more appeal towards their target audience, who in their mind are just young teenage males who would, you know, want to see a bit of tit uh, yeah. <laughs> or cleavage and just want to see a bit more skin. Because yeah. uh, an interesting statistic I, heard, I saw recently was that a third of all male gamers prefer playing as female characters. Mm. Um, the original, say, I mean, the, the first classic assumption is... Um, Men say men like to say straight men like seeing uh, say women and say characters that are attractive, and sure that might play into it a bit. But a, gr- a more deep dive uh, theory is that men, particularly um, cis men who identify as cis men, have difficulty exploring their identity in public. Um, yeah. For those of us uh, NB folk, um, it's less of a problem for us. We're kind of hey, we want to explore our, our identity, but the. Uh, working hypothesis is that for cis men uh, and uh, straight cis men, they do want to explore their identity, but they want a safe space to do it. And I think for them, video games is is a great space uh, for it. Interestingly enough, um, the opposite is entirely untrue for women. It's about a tenth of women who want to play as uh, uh, male characters. Yeah. And that's probably because the majority well, of characters are male. In, yeah, uh, most video, video game characters, characters you do play as happen to be male, and yeah. I think... I mean, particularly, there was a period in the uh, late 2000s where pretty much every video game protagonist was some kind of grizzled veteran whose wife had died. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then Mass Effect came along and we got Femship, and she's massively popular with the um, fan base. It's possibly more, more po- the more popular version of Shepard's End, the yeah. male one. Yeah, exactly. But, so, funny enough, um, so Bioware have been uh, going on this because they've actually run statistics um, and found that it's still a majority of people play as Broshep, but there is still great love for Femship, and her uh, popularity has only been growing. Um, and we've got a, a question here from um, Ivan Arbu. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. Do you think having uh, games with different demographics uh, streaming on YouTube and often, as say, on other platforms, have ha- has had any impact on the general stereotypes about certain gamers, games being for girls or for boys? Do you think it's actually changed anything yet? Or do you think maybe part of what I uh, consider is that I, I think despite being 
as popular as it is, gaming gaming is still and gaming streams are still quite niche in many ways. I know it's still a very niche market, but mm. well, as niche as it is, it's still it's one of the fastest growing forms of entertainment. Mm. As a result, we are seeing more and more um, streamers of of you know of LGBT, more and more female streamers, more and more streamers of ethnic minorities finding their way onto these platforms. Mm -hmm. I've seen many more female streamers on there who are who are just there playing video games. I mean, yeah. Don't get me wrong, there are the odd ones who are there to appeal to more teenage boys or mm -hmm. that male demographic. I'm not going to get But that's that. not necessarily a bad thing. But then when you I mean, look at it, it depends on how you view using um, sexuality yeah. and um, your um, appearance to basically. Um, oh, no, I'm not criticizing all things. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's not necessarily a criticism. I'm um, obviously a lot the of uh, exist, the incel community very much hate that because they yeah. hate women. But then again, I find with the incel community, they hate any woman who streams. Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing Pokemon and another streamer who, get, who got quite a lot of flack for just the sake of existing and being a woman who streams. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another issue which may put off other people of um, smaller yeah. demographics of video games when they see people, people of their demographics getting um, quite a lot of flack and, un well, not necessarily an amount of flack and hatred from mm -hmm. various toxic online groups. Such yeah. as it's, the it's, it's the, it's a, it is the uh, vocal minorities that often cause the problems. I mean, from my perspective, I hope that's the case, really. Because, um, yeah, I have thought of, uh, so there are so I, kind of games that are described I'm... as being for boys and for girls to a certain extent. I mean, it's usually the idea is that games are just for boys. That's that's the uh, general assumption. Yeah. There are, there are no games for girls at all. I mean, but then again, I think that stereotype is um, fading away. I mean, it still persists, but it's nowhere near as prevalent as it was back in, you know, the noughties, mm -hmm. about 10 years ago, where, as you mentioned, every video game protagonist was some grizzled male trying to adventure his dead wife. But then at the same time, <clears throat> at the same time, we do, we, well, while we are seeing, you know, increase in other, minor, other um, demographics being, you know, represented in the streaming industry, we are seeing a fair bit of pushback against that. And again, mm. that might come back to my earlier point that, you know, who was originally perceived as the main demographic of video games, that being white teenage males, yeah. feel like their, their representation is being eroded when mm -hmm. the intention isn't to erode anyone's representation, but yeah. to include others. Yeah, this idea that somehow they have to lose something. You've still got those games with male characters and they've got games where you can play as male characters if you want to. You don't have to do these things. Yeah. basically nobody's forcing you to play as that as a female character i mean sure there are some games where they've been bold enough to say no we're making the character canonically a woman tomb raider being the obvious example yeah. and the fact is i mean there's a got i got a question here and uh, we do hope to get a slightly more high-tech version of this at some point in the future but the, the question is is say, is the industry scared of showing diversity in leading characters due to losing audience or so or sales and i'd say historically yes they've yeah, been I mean... very concerned about that so one very good example of that was um, Battlefield, so Battlefield 1940s, sorry, no, Battlefield... Um, one, isn't it? Is not one, no, no, the one that came after one, so one set in World War II. There are many Battlefield games. <laughs> there are many Battlefield games, so there's Battlefield 1, which was set in World War 1. That, mm -hmm. that performed amazingly well, mm -hmm. and that did have a healthy amount of representation with um, you know, ethnic minorities. In fact, you start off the campaign playing as a... Um, as a Harlem health fighter, which I thought was very yeah. uh, interesting and fascinating. Yeah, that's an interesting way to start it. Yeah, but uh, tell me about uh, the oh, Battlefield Five. That's five, yeah. <laughs> the ordering is very One, weird. Five, that's One. just confusing. <laughs> and then you have. Battle if anything, you know, if, if they were worried, say the thing that would help that hurt their sales is the naming of these things. I am, but, yeah, yeah, you have uh, Battlefield Two, that then and then lot down later, later you had Battlefield Three, then Battlefield One, mm. then Battlefield Five. Name could help. It's confusing. But, but then with Battlefield Five, I remember they got quite a lot of heavy pushback for the inclusion of female soldiers in in the game. Bear in mind, historically accurate. Yes, it is. I mean, I've seen this. I've seen this argument was not of historical actors. See, with other games as well. I mean, in a much smaller example, I've seen this come about with uh, with Rome Post War Two when they included um female generals. Bear in mind, the vast majority of people who played that game were fine with this change. Yeah. They enjoyed it and they. I either enjoyed it or saw no issue with it whatsoever. Yeah, Again, it. there's a vocal minority who just tried to make the point that this is historically inaccurate. This is, you know, eroding historical accuracy. Whilst forgetting, in fact, but that, you know, you had people like Cleopatra, Boudicca. Then they might argue, they but they never led. Leaders. Yeah. Then you can, you had those same individuals saying, well, they never led from the front lines. Well, neither did Caesar, neither no. did Hannibal. Nobody, commanders didn't lead from the front lines at all. The ones who did typically die. <laughs> yeah. They, they weren't leaders for very long, basically. They weren't very successful leaders. Oh, I mean, yeah. But, I mean, the great irony of it is that um, diversity actually sells. 
basically. Yeah. They've been that worried. They, they, sure, they've started to accept it now. They've started to notice. Uh, they remember, there's a, so in the end, capitalism trumps uh, the, uh, bigotry in many cases. Is that because, I mean, for ages they were so worried, and, and yet they still had the example of Tomb Raider. So many male players were more than happy to play Tomb Raider, partly because uh, they found the, say, um, very um, ang angular pixels, let's say, um, <laughs> polygons that was, uh, let's say, uh, Lara Croft at the time attractive. But there were other reasons as well, because they were good games, and she was a good character. She is well written. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's lots of stuff like um, Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, Aloy. She is a, so she is canonically, there is only that, let's say, she's the only player character in there. You can't choose any others. Massively popular game. Yeah, although there was a bit of pushback I've seen was a more recent release. Yes, that is something to be uh, mentioned because she was rendered in a way that is actually very accurate. In the... More realistic, I'd say. Yeah, more realistic because more... Um, humans have hair on their face. Yeah. Even women. It's, it's usually not a very large amount, but it's still there and they went for um, accuracy. So often people get, say, the gaming industry gets flack for realism, <laughs> calling it not realistic. I mean, like I said, we've seen this as Rome Total yeah. War 2, although, like I said, very vocal minority, mm -hmm. and we've seen this with um, Battlefield 5, and I think Battlefield 5 did lose sales, but then again, I think... They, well, they were facing problems anyway. That's, they're, they're, that's more complicated than just their representation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, I suppose another uh, good, say, good thing to talk about uh, the other multiplayer games would be uh, Call of Duty, basically. And the uh, fandom of uh, that, particularly in the multiplayer, because um, particularly Modern Warfare, which was made, um, the original Modern Warfare, there's new ones that, again, they've just called Modern Warfare and Modern yeah. Warfare 2, which is confusing. But the original ones back in the mid 2000s um, came out around about the time of the Iraq War, which meant that a lot of the uh, setting was in uh, the Middle East or something similar to what. Well what we were already experiencing in real life was the Iraq war, yeah. the Iraq invasion. I think this was done on purpose to, you know, appeal to the um, younger demographics who were personally affected by the Iraq war, mm -hmm. who, someone who might have been fighting there themselves or who yeah. known someone who was fighting. Mm -hmm. So this was, you know, meant to be a topic that was something we could more easily emotionally connect to. Mm -hmm. I think because I think before that we had overdone the World War II yeah, era of games. Yeah, because Modern Warfare was um, around about the fourth or fifth game or something like that, because yeah. they done World War Two ages uh, previously, basically. But um, part of the problem, so coming back, is that a lot of the uh, central gameplay in the, in the uh, single-player ca uh, campaign, which actually a lot of uh, Call of Duty ca uh, people don't even play in single-player, but those who do, they face the problem of the fact that it's kind of a case of switch your brain off and shoot round people, which is yeah. just, hmm, that's not great. And then we get to the multiplayer, which, I mean, part of the problem is just that it also creates a kind of unrealistic view of war, that you're basically spraying bullets and you can respawn. Uh, I mean, constant things, yeah. I don't think there's going to be that many people who are saying, all right, I assume if I get shot, I can just wait for a medic. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 sure, that's true. But it certainly yeah, still like gives the kind of idea that you're much, say, in war and in violence, you're much more powerful than you actually are, that you're way more vulnerable. Is that, is this, I mean... It's the classic thing of uh, you go down, everything goes black and white, and then you just wipe the jam off yeah. your face and everything's fine. <laughs> I, I'm sure people don't actually think that that's what happens in war, but I think it made a, a, certainly a number of uh, young men uh, who were uh, playing it have a more kind of gung-ho attitude towards it. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. And, that's it. and I think you can even see some of this attitude on them for then permeate towards the online sphere of gaming. Mm -hmm. The manosphere, as it's uh, referred to uh, by uh, researchers. <laughs> The no manosphere. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can you can almost smell it. Just the oh. name of it there. But then um, but but then but then with the online game, you already have, especially for people who might have played a single player, you already have this power fantasy. You and mm -hmm. if you have played a single player, you'll already expect yourself to perform better than those who haven't online. And this might help, you know, encourage a bit more a bit more of a toxic mindset of how am I not getting the skill? How am I getting killed mm. by this person. Mm. I've played pra campaign or I've played single player, I've had some practice. I'm not saying everyone has this thought process, not everyone plays campaign because, you know, the AI or bots don't tend to perform as well as humans. Mm -hmm. But no, when you have that, but it does, when you have that initial exposure with the FPS you're playing and have that bit of practice, you might expect a bit more of, um, you know, a bit more of an advantage compared to the average human, average human being playing mm -hmm. that game. And um, guns don't work that way in the real world. No. Mm -hmm. But there's also, of course, the uh, problem with the use, liberal use of racial slurs when uh, people get, say, people um, die in games. So, and so this is something I was literally just about to touch upon. So, 
But going back to the whole P- PewDiePie bridge incident, mm. I mean, we've seen we've seen this for a sound of how PewDiePie big stream. I'm not saying he's racist. I don't think no. he holds these racist views. But it's the fact that in the heat of the moment, the first word he used was that word, which itself is very problematic. Why? Why out of any every single out of all the words? Why that one? Why yeah. would why would you say that one by reflex? Unless you normally say that word by reflex. Yeah. And I think, uh, and I think, you know, just showing that on a stream just kind of demonstrates how normalized this behavior mm. has become. And I think this is part, part of the problem because many people who use this word, especially in, you know, spite or anger, are people who view themselves as the only demographic who plays that game. Yeah. And speaking of um, demographics that uh, play games, we've got a uh, question from Adrian Ruddock here. Um, do you think that the increasing level of women participating in the gaming sector, be that in production or playing games, have an impact on the perception of women in wider society? I would like to believe that. But again, I still come back to my uh, feeling that gaming is still relatively niche. It's growing. And what I'm hoping is that it will, certainly, in the future. I don't know if it is yet. What do you think? I believe it is, is the case. And I don't think gaming is as niche as it was. And again, mm. I think that comes down to our biases of what would you consider gaming platforms. Bear in yeah. mind, I mean, I think... Was it ninety two percent of all um, adults played video games? Many yeah. of them were probably being played on their phones. Mm-hmm. Um, how how many times for those who have kids? How many times have you just given your phone or iPad to your toddler or infant to just give them a game to play and you no, know, even distracted while you can do your own thing like put dinner or work or play your own video game? Yeah, pretty much. Or you know, um, I mean, for me, I, I can't help but think it's it's uh, sorry. And I've also and also you noticed know, my mom and my sister tend to play all their video games on their mobile devices. My mm-hmm. mom loves to play um you no. Know, she loves to play Plants vs. Zombies on her iPad. <laughs> wow, old, old classic. Old Plants vs. Zombies 1 and 2, she still plays that today. And my sister does does play first-person shooters on her phone mm-hmm. rather than on consoles. So. Wow. Any of them play Fortnite? Oh, no. Well, my nephew plays Fortnite. Yeah, because I, I find Fortnite to be kind of like a generational thing. Yeah. I don't get Fortnite. I, I, I just don't get the kind of battle. But I think it's due to the popularity of it being streamed as well. And yeah, how no, that's true. Yeah. And because of the skins... Um, I actually talked to um, a middle-aged um, dad um, a while back. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to explain the context. Um, but he was talking about his uh, son who uh, plays it. And for a lot of uh, younger, uh, say, kids, that kind of thing, because of the skins, they really don't uh, they care whether it's uh, male or female or anything like that. They like, the, say, they like the stats that it gives them sometimes, but also they just like the aesthetic. Particularly, yeah. if, uh, I mean, for, uh, Fortnite has done, say, has done the uh, very smart thing of uh, using other franchises. So Marvel being one of the big ones. Um, so people want to play as um, uh, Black Widow or Scarlet, or say Scarlet Witch, that kind of thing. Not because they and and uh, whether, so the fact that they are women is just kind of like, yeah, whatever, they're cool. Yeah. Well, I think for younger generations, I think I think yeah, it could. They definitely um, helped help to um, uh, improve um, certainly uh, perceptions of uh, women. Hopefully, it won't harm. I mean, which is always a possibility. Well, my, in my opinion, anyways, many of these perce- perceptions of how video games and graphics are formed are are formed when you're younger and when you're playing video games yourself. I mean, sure. my perception of what of video game demographics were formed when I was playing No Call of Duty online mm-hmm. when I was a teenager myself, and you know, the people I played against were the people I. Who I, in my opinion, thought, oh, so that's who, what the majority of video game players are. You know. Sure. Now we're going to need to um, end this uh, stream. So I'm, I'm sure we could keep talking about this for hours, but yeah, uh, <laughs> we all have lives we need to get onto. So um, I'm going to wrap up with uh, just a question for you, Michael, which is uh, so running on a theme that we in Quilombo uh, like to ask. What do you, from your perspective, what does it mean to be English nowadays? What do you think? What does it mean to be English? Mm. I mean, oh, that's quite a broad question. I mean. Mm. For me being English, I'm proud of I'm proud of the fact that, well, where I come from in London especially, mm. we are the most diverse country in Europe. Mm. And London being a melting, melting pot of um, diversity in, in England, what makes me happy is that you have people of all sorts of ethnicities and, ra- and races who may not int- interact, well when, interact well in their native countries, but due to um, no border issues or conflicts, but can live side by side as neighbours here. I think that's a good answer. So um, I hope you all in, uh, enjoyed our uh, discussion. Um, feel free to uh, like and subscribe. Uh, click the bell icon to get uh, notifications uh, whenever we put up new videos. Feel free to visit the website, uh, www.quilombo.co.uk. And uh, please watch some of the other videos we've done, some of the other uh, subjects we've uh, covered about diversity and inclusion. 
Thank you. And thank you very much for having me, Peter. Oh, it's great having you. Yeah, you too, Michael. All right. Awesome. <laughs> we'll sign up. Is that...